In the same city of Anderson, Indiana, we find the home of another member of the General Motors family, Guide Lamp Division. This unit was started as a separate entity in 1906 and became a part of the corporation's group in 1928. It is a manufacturer of lighting equipment for automotive purposes, and since it became a part of the General Motors family, it has been the corporation's sole supplier. Today, its lamp equipment is used on all General Motors cars. The video we have is the open house that they had at Guide Lamp two months before Pearl Harbor. This was two months before the war started, and uh, the people are coming in for a nice day, and uh, it's all, they had over 7,000 people came to the open house that they had out there at that time. You consider there was less than 3,000 people working at the, the plant. That was a, a pretty good turnout for it. The, uh, most of these films were shot in, in the uh, AVAX building, or the old Jenny Motor Company building. The automobiles that are in the background here are 1941. The last automobiles that they made until after the war was over. They had a daycare center there for people who didn't want to take their kids through the open house. And uh, it's cute kids there, you consider that today they're 80 years old.
Now the younger women that are in there, more than likely, are gonna be working out there in just a matter of a few months. This here's part of the uh, buffing department. And you can see in the background, there's a number of women working back there when this was shot. Boys coming through here and uh, they don't know it, but in two months their world's going to change. They're all going to be more than likely drafted, and those girls right there will probably be in there working on a uh, on a line somewhere. The guide lamp had 1,193 of their employees that served during the war, and out of that, there was 33 of them were killed. This is a real unusual part of this film. There was one piece of film in there that was colored. 1941, that would have been probably the very first of the color film. This is 16 millimeter, which was the home movies at that time. Now here's two fellows coming here, the 1941 Anderson High School uh, sweaters. Pearl Harbor hit, completely stopped production in there. Uh, they pulled all the machinery out of the plants, Dalco and Guide both, and uh, moved the equipment that they didn't need at the time. They all moved it all to a couple warehouses here in, in town. And as they set up the new lines, they would go there and, and pull out the, the machinery they need, needed to uh, set those lines up.
They used to have a lot of beauty contests out there. Every, every year they would have a uh, company picnic down at Riverside Amusement Park in Indianapolis, and they always had a beauty queen. America goes to war. Men of the Army, Navy, and Marines reinforce the battlefronts on six continents to save the homes and ideals of free men from Axis domination. Now this part of the film here is the E-Flag presentation out at Guide. And the E-Flag was the highest award that the government could give a, a private company. The E stood for excellence in production. And uh, Guide Lamp was pre presented one, and Delco Ramey was also presented an E-Flag. We had Greer Steel here in Anderson and Anaconda, and the other two uh, businesses that were given E-Flags. town people that come out to see the flag presented that and the, the uh, people that worked in the plant. see up on the stage here the little fence is made up of 90 millimeter, 105 millimeter, and 37 millimeter shell cases. And those are 50 caliber machine guns. I think there's like three of them along there. This, this is the E-flag. And the fellow that was presented to there is Governor Schricker. And, uh, Every six months after the flag was presented to a company, they reevaluated them. If they passed everything, they uh, gave them a star for on their flag. Guide Lamp ended up with four stars on theirs. They only flew the E flags on kind of special occasions. stage and everything was on the back part of the cafeteria.
getting ready, he's gonna pin something on this fella's shirt here. And what he's pinning on his shirt's an E-pin. E Everybody that worked out there that uh, was working there when they were presented the flag got one of these little pins. People are all headed back into the plant. They they did this at their on their dinner break, so they wouldn't stop production in the plant. And as soon as it was over, everybody went right back into the, went back to work. To me, this is the most interesting part of our exhibit, is the uh, World War II and what Guy Lamp did uh, for the war effort during World War II. The uh, Liberator was made out there during World War II. It was a top secret project at the time, and it was uh, intended to be dropped behind the uh, lines for the resistance movements to use. Uh, 
45 caliber single shot and it uh, came with 10 rounds of 45 caliber ammunition. The whole thing is uh, this stamped out metal, the, the barrel is a piece of pipe and it costs $2.10 to manufacture. They build a million of them in 90 days from the day they come up with the idea of making these things until they had a million of them on skids, it was 90 days. The other gun down here is a M3 submachine gun and it was built to take the place of the Thompson submachine gun. The Thompson cost $250 a piece to manufacture. The M3s were $22 a piece and by the end of the war they had them down to $15 a piece. They fired a uh, 45 caliber round just like the Liberator pistol did. The barrel was rifled and there was only two machine parts in it, the barrel and a part of the firing mechanism on the inside. The rest of it was all stamped, stamped metal. They were meant for, uh, mainly when they got into the uh, buildings and stuff over there in Europe where they were fighting from room to room. They probably didn't have a range of over 20 or 30 foot, you know. lamps and tail lights for uh, vehicles over there, military vehicles. We have a few examples that are really hard to find and uh, they made the special cover that went on the tail lights so they could run convoys at night and if an airplane came over it wouldn't, wouldn't be able to see their light. The blackout lamp they called it. The other thing they built out there was uh, the barrels for 50 caliber machine guns. They built a million and a half of those. They're still using some of these. I was in Vietnam and they, uh, we had 50 calibers over there that used the same barrel. Also made shell casings. They made uh, 37 millimeter, 90 millimeter, and 105 millimeter. The uh, 37s were anti-aircraft uh, rounds. The 90s were for were also anti-aircraft, and they were for high-flying uh, bombers and things like that. They, when they uh, made a uh, shell casing, they started off with a round slug of brass and it went through 16 operations where it went through a press every time it would uh, extend the uh, the length of the uh, the uh, brass casing and then they would finish it off at the end when they uh, when they got it done by the end of the war they, they were starting to make uh, some steel shell casings out there too brass was getting really hard to come by The uh, 105 millimeter shells coming down the line. A lot of times, fellows that worked out there, when they would be home on leave or something, they would come out and visit. Here's a fellow here who apparently was wounded. He's on crutches there. The ladies all gathered around him there. He's quite the hero there. That's a uh, soldier, he's probably coming back. He has gathered up uh, Japanese currency and they've taped them together. It's showing off his war souvenir is what he's doing. This is plant security and this is called a Minuteman flag. 
and they rewarded Minuteman flags out there for uh, selling bonds. Now this is a uh, grouping of ladies uh, working on a, a table out there. Uh, they're working on the M3 submachine guns. And believe it or not, this lady right here in the middle uh, was in here and she was telling me about her job. She said her job was to take a file and file around the sights of these M3s. There was always a burr there and her job was to file that off. And she was looking around and looked up there and said, well, there I am. And she, she named off the other ladies that were on the line there with her. I thought that was, that was, uh, that was really something. She hired in out there during the war right out of high school. Uh, that there is a set of headlamps that went on a, on a bumper uh, that was in our military uh, photographs and I'm assuming those, are, those went on a, be something like a staff car or something like that. This is a boxes of ammunition and every time they would build an M3 submachine gun they would fire a whole, whole round of uh, a whole magazine of ammunition through it. They had a firing range underneath the cafeteria over there. And uh, when they finally tore the plants down, when they were tearing them down, they got into an area there that was uh, these big chunks of lead. And it's just built up from all the, uh, uh, all the firing that they did over the years there. The photographs we got here are of an open house that they had near the end of the war. It surprises me that they had an open house, but uh, some pretty neat ones here.